All right, today's session is going to be about 15 to 20 minutes in length. And it's really about uh, a high level review of what activated carbon will and won't actually do. It's one of the um, very common misconceptions that we run into all the time um, in tech service and tech support, the lack of understanding about what activated carbon is really there to perform to do. We get a lot of um, customers that will say, we'll have a TDS meter before and after a carbon filter and the reading won't change. And they'll say, well, my filter isn't working. And that just represents a, a fundamental misunderstanding of what activated carbon actually does. So we're going to take a look at activated carbon this morning. So activated carbon comes from natural sources, basically um, anything with a, a, a strong cellulose fiber uh, in its structure. And that's typically organic. <laughs> Coconut carbon um, is a source of one of the purest grades of activated carbon out there. And the reason for this is this husk. When we look at um, activated carbon, where that source material comes from impacts its pore structure, its functionality when it comes to removal, and also the amount of potential uh, contamination within it, because all living plants draw, draw mineral content and water from the soil they're grown in. And you can get, depending on what soils they're grown in, different contaminants into the structure of the plant material. Uh, activated coconuts grow typically in, in areas of the world. We have a lot less um, heavy metal contamination. So you end up with less um, of heavy metals and things within their pore structures. So they tend to be more refined from the start. Less activation is required to get to the quality you want. Um, and activated carbon has been a, a strategic resource. It's one of the reasons why during World War II, I'm kind of a history buff, that the Philippines were, were, were so important. You had the oil, but you also had activated carbon from coconut shells to purify water was very, very critical resource back then, as it is today. Coconut carbon offers some of our best uh, selections for purifying water. Now, we also will get activated carbon from coal. Um, the majority of it's going to come from bitumous coal. Uh, there are some lignite uh, activated charcoal products, but most of it comes from bitmus coal. And coal is nothing more than layer upon layer of organic material deposited in an anaerobic deposition in the ground. And this is all plant fibers that have been compressed and, and broken down over time by pressure into cellulose fiber. But that contact with water in earth strata and, and other rocks Coal tends to have more impurities in it because of the way it was formed than does wood or coconut carbon. So understanding the source will also let us understand why we may have issues with that product. Then sawdust, wood pulp. This is a common um, use of a waste stream, waste wood and things like that. Uh, to produce activated carbon. It's kind of a balance between uh, coconut carbon and coal carbon, somewhere in between, because we're dealing with the, the trunk of the tree. That's where you're going to see more of those contaminants reside is in those fibers rather than in the seed product as in a coconut. So activated carbon. This is a product and a technology that uh, is one of the most versatile technologies that man uses for water purification. We take it for granted. This stuff is just amazing. It's almost as amazing as the water we use to treat. 
it is used in so many products from air filters, water filters, in every manufacturing industry, chemical industry, food process industry to purify products throughout all of human society, this product is layered in and we take it for granted. So understanding that it's just about everywhere. So how do we make this product? So there are some factors that impact the activation product process. The type of raw material that's selected will determine the activated carbon's properties. The raw material will be impacted by its pore structure, the purity of that end product, and whether or not it's going to be a good candidate for chemical activation for selective removal. There are lots of things that carbon manufacturers will do to activated carbon um, to put different chemical functional groups on it to give it more of a focus removal characteristic. So, and those are rather tightly held trade secrets. So I'm not going to go into those specifics today. And then there's steam activation and steam activation is something that um, for all water purification is what's typically done with activated carbon. So the better starting material yields a better final product. Um, that's really the issue here. Just like every toolbox, you want to select the right tool for the job. So how is activated carbon made? Well, you take that raw charcoal. Well, that charcoal is made by um, basically burning wood material or coal in a low oxygen environment, breaking that into chunks. Then it's put into a high temperature furnace with no oxygen. And that's critical because we don't want combustion. We want thermal degradation, which is completely different. That's done at 850 C. That, if you had oxygen present, would combust the charcoal into nothing but ash, which is not what we want. We want activated carbon. No oxygen is used. Then once it comes out of that process, it is crushed and sieved to the size they want. At this point in time, it can be used as granulated activated carbon, the BAU type. This is real crude version of this. This is for large scale industrial processes where you, they're, they're, this is like stage one in treatment. Now, when it comes to products that we use, you may get the BAU type of activated carbon milled, and that goes in the products. But for water treatment, typically uh, for, for drinking water or process water in a manufacturing facility, you're going to go through a couple more steps. And one of those is additional chemical treatment, and that's typically acid washing the carbon. And what the acid wash does is it pulls those heavy metals out of the pore structure of the activated carbon, purifying it and keeping it from releasing those contaminants during treatment. And then you have a low ash activated carbon because that acid washing also removes the ash from the um, carbon as well. And this is where you get your standard chlorine type removal activated carbon. Now for chloramine removal, what's going to happen is you're going to take, you're going to skip this milling step. Okay. You're going to go to this acid wash chemical treatment and you're going to take this carbon, remill it and then reactivate it. This will happen four to seven times more um, for to produce chloramine carbon. And what this does is it produces exponentially larger numbers of activated sites on the carbon. Carbon has two abilities that it really does well from a chemical process standpoint. And this creates that reactivation multiple times over creates logarithmic scale increase in the number of activated carbon sites on the carbon for chloramine removal.
Now, factors that influence the carbon's effectiveness, the circumfer circumferential surface area of the granules, basically what is your liquid going to have contact with? The surface area of the pores in the immediate vicinity of the surface. So how big are the openings in the pores? Will they allow things to go into them? Deeper internal pore structure contribute, contributes less to the activity, but will contribute to dirt loading and organic removal. Catalytic surface site regeneration has a large effect on total capacity. And this is something to understand about EverPure products and Pentec products. We, when we certify our products at NSF, we do it under continuous flow, not pulse flow. And, and that's critical to understand um, the difference between our products and other manufacturers. Because activated carbon has this ability when dealing with pulsed flow to reactivate or migrate or pass um, contaminants through to other ports of parts of the molecule, refreshing that activation site as it rests. So you can get up to 50% the capacity rated on a cartridge based on pulsed flow. We never state that because we can't predict that pulse flow pattern our customer is going to use. So we test a continuous flow. So realize the life on our cartridges is shorter than what it's going to be in practicality, unless you're using a continuous flow all the time, which normally with our products is the case. The effectiveness of purification of activated carbon depends on several factors. The starting, the nature of the starting su substance, um, substances with a high molecular mass and low water solubility are adsorbed better. That means the organics in the water, the larger they are, the easier it is for carbon to remove them. It's this is that oil and water separation, polar, nonpolar. The surface of activated carbon is nonpolar for the most part and it attracts the organics. The concentration of the substance to being removed, the higher the concentration, the more of it we're gonna remove. This is just about the odds of a molecule of something in water contacting the activated carbon. That's why we want dense structures that allow flow with activated carbon. We want those contaminants bouncing and making contact with that activated carbon. If there's too much room, it's not going to reach out into the water and grab things. It's all predicated on what bounces off that activated carbon as it's flowing through that filter cartridge. It must make contact with that surface in order for it to be removed. The presence of other compounds, which result in uh, competition for available space. Now, this is one of the reasons why we want filters changed out on time because there is chemical preference to what is removed by activated carbon. And once you load carbon to a specific point, other contaminants that are more preferential may start to push those contaminants off activated carbon as it's saturated with contamination. So that's why we have a change out schedule. We want that removed. And then there's parameters of the liquid itself, temperature, pH, things like that, that will impact uh, the effectiveness of how, how activated carbon. Uh, really soft waters affect activated carbon um, by making the cellulose fibers a little more bushy. High levels of sodium in the water will make those cellulose fibers remaining in the activated carbon bushy. Uh, so that's why you see in soft water, sometimes activated carbon will, will plug. It's time to change to a different type of activated carbon in that scenario. Other key performance variables when it comes to uh, filters. Selecting the right carbon. If you're dealing with chloramine or lots of... Um, 
like pharmaceutical contaminants, chloramine carbon is a better choice because of the activation sites. Uh, it's based on the type of the source carbon as well. You want a better purification job, move, migrate towards wood and then coconut carbon as your best product. Grain size, the physical size of the grain matters. Um, the larger the grain is going to allow higher flow rates around it. The smaller the grains, you are going to um, get better removal, but you're going to get an increased pressure drop. So there's always a balance in filtration between removal and pressure drop. Fluid flow pattern of the filter matters. The geometry of the cartridge, radial flow versus axial flow. Why? Because radial flow is from the outside of the filter in, and the bed of carbon is literally the diameter of the filter, less the core. Or you can have axial flow, which is going to go down the length of the cartridge. Most of our cartridges are radial flow. Our inline cartridges, or GAC filters, tend to be axial flow. And you'll experience, tend to experience more pressure drop with axial flow cartridges than radial flow. So the physics of how we're applying this product matter as well. So how does activated carbon work? Here's a, a schematic of a granule of activated carbon. And that activated carbon process creates this pore structure. And the size of this pore structure determines what it's going to be really good at removing. I'm not going to go into iodine number and molasses number and things like that. If you want to go into that sort of uh, deep discussion, uh, we can at some point in time, uh, but we're going to keep it high level. But basically, with the increase in surface area from activation, we're able to coat all of that surface area with organics. The smaller stuff is going to migrate in deeper into the pore structure, and the larger stuff is going to stick to the surface or clog those pores. And this is only this is only discussing the organics removal from the water, the non-polar sort of removal from the water, or those organics with a dual nature with a polar end and a non-polar end. That stuff will be removed in this sort of process. And if you think about this like the shoreline of a lake, there's a lot of shoreline here, and that's the surface that the organic molecules are going to cling to. So activated carbon. Carbon is not charged at most of its surface. And absorption is where it gets stuck to that surface. This is oil and water. This is uh, oils on your Tupperware after they come out of the dishwasher uh, because your water's too hard, the detergent didn't get a chance to pull them out. So they adhere to that surface. That's what activated carbon is doing with organics. So as a carbon block, this is the surface that your organics are going to stick to and as it weeds it weighs through. This technology has been used for thousands of years going back to the ancient Egyptians and Persians who have used this technology for thousands of years. This is a, one of the oldest technologies man has for purifying water. So those contaminants stick to the surface, and this will act as a dirt filter, okay? There is a very different dynamic between dirt loading and chemical extraction with activated carbon, and that's critical to understand. We'd rather use a pre-filter to manage our dirt load than waste our activated carbon filters managing dirt. Now, how chlorine is removed by activated carbon. Um, well, chlorine, generically, is hypochlorous acid. 
as a chemical in the water. This is a strong oxidizer. What activated carbon does, it's activated sites. And depending on the form, uh, the treatment done by the, the manufacturer, those are going to tend to be carboxylic acid groups or alcohol groups. Getting a little deep in the weeds here on chemistry. But what really is happening here is the activated site, depending on what it is, will be oxidized by the hypochlorous acid. The oxygen will remain behind and you will generate chloride and acid. This is why you see a slight pH drop after a brand new activated carbon filter. Then it balances out. So we're converting hypochlorous acid into chloride in H+. Since chlorine only exists hypochlorous acid in water supplies between two and four parts per million, this isn't a significant addition. It shouldn't affect water chemistry significantly unless you're dealing with large scale plant operation and then some flushing is required there. So you get basically this um, oxidation of this site on the carbon. This actually indicates a conversion of an alcohol group to a carboxylic acid group in the water. If you want to understand a little bit more of the chemistry here. But carbon manufacturers will change what this little asterisk is, that functional group on the carbon, to do different things. And believe me, they're kind of reluctant to share that. So what was that again? This is a, a, a little bit better view of what a granular of activated carbon, granule of activated carbon looks like. You get these activated sites, okay, on the surface, but this entire other surface area is what's gonna be removing the organics. And these sites are what's doing the chloride reduction of hypochlorous acid. So, and then on regeneration, you're going to get migration of this oxygen passed in between this pore structure. So one of the fun things about organic chemistry is you get resonant pores in carbon like this. So they change as they sit and they'll pass that oxygen around that they pull apart and reorganize things, allowing for more hypochlorous acid to be broken down. I didn't go into the chl uh, chloramine removal mechanism in this presentation because it's a lot more complicated than that. I didn't want to scare people with that. But so now what does carbon remove and what it doesn't? This is where um, we have to explain to our customers and end users all the time what this product is really designed for. It will remove total organic carbon or reduce it. TOC in the water, taste and odor compounds, the tannins, um, organics, pharmaceuticals, um, activated carbon will remove lots of different compounds from the water. And there is a difference between a product being able to remove something and being rated to remove a specific amount. So understand that not all of our filters are gonna be rated for specific contaminant removal, unless there's a business case around that contaminant, for, for around that certification. Um, I understand my GAC filter is going to be removing ph pharmaceuticals. I don't understand how much, but I know it's gonna be doing some of that. Um, having a product certified quantifies how much it will remove by weight. Um, and then there's specialized activated carbons for chlorine or chloramine removal. And choosing the right one is critical. Chlor chloramine carbon will remove significantly more chlorine than standard activated carbon. Standard activated carbon will remove one-tenth of the chloramine that a chloramine-activated carbon will. So realize you will get 
or amine removal with standard carbon, but you will not have the life in a chloramine sanitation system. Now, what passes through activated carbon? Total dissolved solids, mineral content, salts. I'm saying the same thing in multiple different ways, just to, so you can speak the same language as your customer. Hardness, calcium, iron, magnesium, none of this stuff will be removed from the water supply chemically. If you have particulate hardness, calcium, iron, magnesium, if you've got the particles of that stuff as oxides or hydroxides, yes, an activated carbon filter will remove some of that depending on its micron rate. But that's where dirt loading comes in. You're dealing with dirty water, let's put a pre-filter in front of it so we can keep our activated carbon doing what we're spending the money on, chemically removing things from water and manage our dirt load with a pre-filter. I'm a big fan of that, why? I'm cheap. I'd rather throw out a cheap pre-filter several times a year than my expensive activated carbon filter. So one of, can you address the empty contact time required for chlorine and chloramines and organics and how they differ? I could, but I, I, I this isn't really the format to go into uh, a deep dive into the mechanisms of those. Really, uh, the difference between, in layman's terms, of chlorine and chlorine removal is contact time. And the reason for that is that conversion from hypochlorous acid to chloride in a hydrogen proton happens at a very, very quick kinetic rate. Okay? Now, chloramine. That chlorine ammonia bond, because chlorine, chloramine is literally hypochlorous acid reacted with ammonia to produce chloramine. So that chlorine ammonia bond takes time to break. And the catalytic sites on activated carbon need to break that bond apart. And that takes the most amount of time and contact time with the activated carbon. From that point on, once we break that bond, we can remove that ammonium ion and we can convert that chloride, that chlorine that's left into hypochlorous acid, from hypochlorous acid into chloride very, very quickly. It's all about the chemical kinetics of breaking that chlorine ammonia bond with chloramine. Now, organics, this is just simply oil and water. The more contact time you get, the more torturous path you get, the more contact you're going to get with the activated carbon. Um, 18 grams of water. You're talking 12 to 13 milliliters of water as six times 10 to the 23 power, 23rd power molecules in it, in 13 milliliters of water. That's a trillion is a number we can't even get around, our heads around. A mole of water that represents that 13 milliliters is a hectillion. It's three groups to the left of a trillion. That's how massive a mole of water is. And a parts per million is reflected in that number. So when you're talking about a glass of water and the chemistry involved, you're talking about, and even in, in hundreds of parts per million, is still a relatively small amount compared to the number of water molecules in there. And as that water is going through, those individual molecules of contaminants must hit that activated carbon in order to be removed. So what we're doing is statistically making it next to impossible for those contaminants to travel through that activated carbon and not contact the surface. Once it contacts that surface or activation site, chemistry takes over. But until then, 
activated chemistry doesn't really work like it's an intelligent thing scavenging these things from the water. It is a statistical probability event where it's just the odds of something bouncing off that carbon gets it to react with the surface of that carbon, removing it. So residence time, depending on a activated carbon, is a test done to test the theoretical ability of a carbon to hold contaminant. Um, and that's different than flow. We use those numbers to design filters to get that contact time or an acceptable contact time for the contaminant infiltration design. So you can go down a rather deep rabbit hole discussing empty contact times for specific contaminants. That's why we have third party certification is to make sure that what individual manufacturers are saying about their activated carbon is true and verifiable. So um, that sort of uh, deep dive into activated carbons um, also requires a little more knowledge of the specific activated carbon itself and its process. And sometimes that's information that's hard to get your hands on. Um, question about our Chlor Plus filters. Um, yes, they're rated for removing chloramines and they will have a dual rating on a Chlor Plus cartridge. It'll have a rating for chlorine and chloramine. Um, certification is a big, big issue when it comes to activated carbon. Um, Everpure and Pentex cartridges are rated for a balanced water, which means there is dirt load in the water. Not extremely dirty, not extremely clean, but we're using tap water. Other manufacturers will have their products certified without a dirt load associated with the water stream. So they're able to say, yeah, we'll get 200,000 gallons of chlorine removal from this cartridge but that's without any dirt load. We have a balanced system in our certifications when we get them done um, to emulate an average water quality in quotes, air quotes, so that um, we reflect so a little more of reality. That's where going into certifications and looking at the NSF ratings, it's important to understand. Um, if we rated our 7-CLM or XCLM just for chlorine removal. You could get 10 times the chlorine removal out of it than the rated chloramine removal capacity. Why? Because it's more effective at removing chlorine than chloramine because of the difficulties associated with it. Now, when... Um, you look at certifications, understand that dirt load is not always factored in in everyone else's product. Uh, but Chlor Plus is uh, rated for removing chloramines. You'll see dual ratings on its spec sheet, one for chlorine, one for chloramine. One of the things you'd like to announce to uh, everyone this year is the creation of the training dot request at pentair.com email address. This is available on uh, the Components Group Partner Center. And we're, when we're allowed to travel again, uh, we'll be able to uh, address requests for in-person product training, in-person troubleshooting training, water quality, basics of water treatment, opportunity training, uh, valves, controls, uh, filter cartridges, reverse osmosis systems, all product-centric training. Uh, if you just want to sit around and talk shop, bounce jobs or ideas off of us, um, we're happy to do that. Or just feedback sessions are about the product so we can understand uh, issues you may be having. Uh, and hopefully we can put that in the right ear. Um, you know, the great thing about water treatment is it's uh, um, lots of ways to skin the cat. 
Is chlorine dioxide easy to remove uh, or like chloramine? Um, chlorine dioxide uh, is a little easier to remove than chloramine. Um, but most of our filters are not rated for it since chlorine dioxide tends to be a, um, a less frequently used sanitizer and its breakdown products end up being hypochlorous acid anyways and chloride. So there, there's some crossover there in its extraction and removal. But good question there. Feel free to ask any questions if you have one. Feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, if you don't have any questions and you want to drop off, feel free to do so and uh, have a wonderful and safe day if you do. But if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Well, if there aren't any more questions, thank you very much for attending. And if you know anyone who could use to see this, it's offered again today at 3 p.m. Thank you so much for joining. Have a wonderful and safe day. Oh, what type of activated carbon you would, would you recommend for effluent treatment? Oh, that is a whole other can of worms. Um, the, Essentially, you're talking about requirements for the Clean Water Act and things like that. That is going to depend solely upon the contaminants you're trying to remove. That's when you really need to understand what that waste stream is. And to be honest with you, without that information, there is no way to make that recommendation. Um, because when it comes to waste stream, selecting the right media is gonna have significant cost impact. Sometimes that is activated carbon. Sometimes that is resins, selective resins for doing that sort of work. So there, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack with there. Oh, typically for sewage treatment plants. Oh, now, now that is a real can of worms. Sewage treatment is a prone, profoundly dynamic environment and sewage treatment plants, the contamination is a reflection of the community it's in. Um, it depends on what you're trying to remove. Um, are you treating for organics, pharmaceuticals and things like that? It depends on the process how much biological you know, and anaerobic digestion are they doing? You know, what is their overall process and what's gonna be good for that process? Um, you're gonna be doing you know, fog tests, fat oils and greases and all that sort of stuff to determine load. That, that's really a, a case specific sort of environment. You know, that, yeah. That is a really, really tough question. And, and to be honest with you, um, I would suggest reaching out. Uh, I'll see if I can dig out some of my contacts that do effluent treatment. I focus mainly, mainly on influent treatment. So um, I don't wanna steer anybody wrong on the effluent treatment because there is such significant regulatory impact to those sorts of statements. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, to be honest. Um, so with that, uh, it's really, really going to depend on the sludge. I mean, right now they're, they're doing coronavirus testing at sewage treatment plants to determine outbreak status and untested contamination. So the amount of information and contaminants and, and, and view and perspective on sewage treatment that is a field in and of itself, unfortunately.
what type of carbon should you use treating sulfur? Um, oh, no problem for the difficult question. Um, that's what we're here for. But I can tell you this, I'm not going to shoot you wrong if I don't know either. That's a that's just a tough question to answer on sewage treatment from a chemistry perspective. You've got so much going on there. Uh, no worries. Uh, for for sulfur remover, removal and activated carbon, it depends on where that sulfur is coming from. Hydrogen sulfide, you're going to want to go H2S. You're going to want to go with a catalytic carbon, a highly activated carbon, because it's those catalytic sites, because hydrogen sulfide is an oxidizer as well. And it's going to be oxidized similar to hypochlorous acid in this regard. And the sulfur is going to be gassed off out of these systems. Some of it will be resorbed, will be uh, uh, absorbed by the carbon and eventually you'll overload it and get some out. Um, how much sulfur you're dealing with is going to determine which one is best in those situations. And if um, sulfur and you've got iron along with it, you may consider air oxidation with that activated carbon to remove the iron and sulfur and then filter it as well. So there's lots of ways to skin a cat, but I would go with a catalytic carbon when dealing with hydrogen sulfide removal. Um, and then it's going to be comparing the brands. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to make a brand recommendation for you, uh, but it'll be a catalytic carbon or a chloramine carbon with extra activated sites. But that's a good question on hydrogen sulfide removal. Because to, to be to be honest with you, <laughs> we use a lot of different activated carbons at that here. We we shop OEMs of activated carbon to build cartridges for specific purposes as well. Just like you're going to do with the components with a tank, you're going to shop activated carbon to put the right carbon in the tank. <clears throat> I would suggest if I was a dealer in an area, I would be, I would spend a half an hour, one afternoon, an hour looking at different activated carbons for hydrogen sulfide removal and, you know, ask your peers that do it in that area. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for attending. I love the questions this morning. I love getting put on the spot uh, and having to dust off my brain here a bit. Um, thank you. And feel free if anybody needs to attend or you got something you want to grill me about later on this afternoon, this afternoon feel free on stopping in. Um, but when it comes to specific contaminant removal, like hydrogen sulfide, lots of different ways to skin that cat. Um, it's going to also depend on your individual water quality surrounding that hydrogen sulfide as well. So if you know some more about the water quality, shoot me an email at that training.request at petair.com, and we can dig into some of the facts a little bit more so we understand the whole context. That's one of the things about water treatment uh, that gets overlooked. We kind, of, we kind of get tunnel vision on a specific contaminant, and we forget that that contaminant exists in the context of the water it's in. There's other things that will influence its removal there. So let us know what else is in your water a little bit, and we'll be able to help out a lot more. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.